We're live. We're on. No. Thank you guys for coming. This is this is my favorite Ignite series or class, I should say. Oh. Buyers, for those of you that don't know me, I was a buyer's agent heavy for three and four years uh, before I went to both sides. This is the first Ignite class I was trained on. And I've learned how to integrate everything that the class in Ignite has to offer, as well as introduce to you guys uh, for the first time, Ignite the disc profile. The disc profile is what I use heavily to win buyers. Um, so let's just jump right into it. First and foremost, the class is called How to Find and Win Buyers. Okay. As far as finding buyers goes, we are going to briefly talk about that. So if you guys want to take yourself off of mute, that would be great. Let's just briefly talk about how to find buyers because buyers – in my world are the easiest to find. I think in our world, they're the easiest to find and they're always gonna be the easiest to find in a seller's market. So we're dealing with the seller's market today, but if we were watching this video and we've, we've turned to a buyer's market, all of these same things still apply. So um, what are some just, just random things off the top of your head that you can find buyers with? Sink. Sink, so- Open house. Your neighbors. Facebook ads. Um, okay, click ads, internet lead generation. Yep. Fear of influence. Fear of influence. Heaviest one. What are some things we can't do right now that it's hard to do? Open house. Open house. Door knock. Door knock. Networking events. I group door knocking and cold calling in the same type of category, just if everybody's out there on listening. There's one, the one last one. Again, it's uh, similar to open houses. There's not a lot of it going on right now. Networking. Networking events. Mm -hmm. So, no matter how new you are to this game, everyone knows how to find buyers. It, it's how to win buyers. It's how to pick up that 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 piece in the conversation to have it go your way, if you will. So. Again, we're not gonna hit too hard on, on how to find them. We know how to find them. If you're at scripts practice, I'll teach you the dialogue for each an individual list or each individual um, lead generation source that we just talked about, right? If you want a cold call, I'll teach you that. If you want a door knock, I'll teach you that. Open houses, networking, whatever you guys need. So as we go through and we start, we're gonna we're gonna really take this one from start to finish. Unlike the unlike the sellers. Um, the sellers, there's, there's about three different Ignite series and with buyers, there's this one and, and find and show homes. So find and show homes, we'll, we'll tailor that, but pretty much everything else today, we're going to talk about winning with buyers. And I want to take you guys through kind of that process or that journey, similar to what I think we did with a seller, but it was more just leading up to the appointment. Ow. Forgot they have horse flies out here. Jeez, ow. <laughs> Sorry, that scared the bejesus out of me. How about spill my coffee? Um, we're going to take you through how, how the buying process works. Why, why do buyers think a little differently than sellers? But as you work with a buyer, you need to kind of think as a seller. You see, a seller's already gone through the process because they already bought the house the first time around, right? And since they bought the house the first time around, they kind of have a little bit of an understanding of what's going on. Thanks, honey. They have a little bit of an understanding of what's going on, but a buyer, it seems like whether a buyer's bought a home before or not, doesn't make too big of a difference in this world right now. Um, because everything changes, because lending changes, regulations change, the market changes, um, whether or not, unless you have a seasoned investor, buyers traditionally ask, very similar questions. Buyers traditionally um, think the same way. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of terms for buyers in our world. Uh, buyers are liars is a, is a good one. And I honestly think that that phrase buyers are liars comes from us as an agent, not having the ability or understanding that buyers simply seem like they're lying because they don't know the process. They really, really, really don't understand how it works. And because of 
social media and internet and, and, and everything that they go through, there's a big preconceived notion of how it all works. Nobody really knows, right? On a selling side, it, it's kind of a little, it's a little simpler for a seller, for a seller to understand, right? Well, I know I need to have an agent sell my home. I know I need to probably put a sign in the yard and I need to get it clean and ready for showing. And it's just a little easier. It's a little easier to walk through. The hardest part about a seller is they have to pay the commission. So they have some objections. Their house may not be ready, but for a buyer, the buyers are liars because if we don't ask enough questions. They can really do things that cross with a hold up. So we're going to really dive in deep today with buyers and, and what I call three questions deep. Understanding how a buyer works and then also using some punchlines to really help them understand and the analogy behind why they need to get lender pre-approval. First, why is it that they need to go and look at the homes that they potentially want to buy and that this is not just some sort of fun game that we play to go see 50 different houses because you're excited about buying a home, right? You can be excited and you can also see a lot of homes online, but if we do it right, we can keep that excitement going and we can show them on average about five to seven homes. So we're not going to talk too much about what we do in homes today, but I'm going to get you guys to the point where if you set the expectations that we're going to talk about on average, you guys are going to show five to seven homes before they make an offer. I want to precurse with that because that's an average, right? Some people I show, they buy, the, they buy the first or second house they see. So that kind of skews the average. Then the other thing is, is I'm not sitting here telling you guys that I don't show 30 plus homes to different buyers. The reality is, is that in a seller's market, if I'm showing 30 plus homes to different buyers, I'm just going to do quick math and divide that by seven homes. I'm probably, I'm probably writing right around four to five offers during that time period. So in my opinion, if they're willing to make an offer and you get them to make an offer within the first five to seven showings, you're doing the right things. Don't get discouraged around showing them 30 homes and, and having three and four different offers. It means you're still doing the right things. It's just, it's the market. It's something that we can't control right now can't control how much a buyer has for an appraisal deficit clause. You can't control what a buyer's tolerance level is for an inspection, those types of things. So if they're making offers, that is a success. And if we can keep that within like five to seven to eight homes, um, you guys are going to spend a lot of less time with buyers. Does anybody know kind of the average, like let, on, on, a, on a very level market, maybe sways to a seller's market or a little bit on a buyer's market, does anybody know what the average hours per seller um, that an agent spends? Does anybody know those averages? Or buyer? 20. Okay. Sellers is 20 hours. On average, even on an even market, what do you think we spend with buyers? 90. 40, 40, 50. 40, 50. 40 50 hours. It feels like 90. It, it, it can feel like 90, yeah. And so one of the things that I understood is if it's going to take me double the time to work with a buyer and I'm a buyer's agent, one, how do I minimize that? How do I break that down to where I want to average about 20 hours with the buyer? Two, how do I get to the point where if I'm working with a buyer for a half of the time and a listing side of things, the goal the rule of thumb is you need to pull two leads off of a listing. How am I going to pull two leads off of a buyer as well as cut my time in half with them and still be genuine, still take care of them and still have them understand that I'm here for them and I'm here to take care of them. And what it is, is it's, it's the winning with buyers part. It's the, how we set expectations. It's how we do our, um, you know, it, it's how we do our presentation. It's the, it's the questions we ask. Um, and, and, and really the secret sauce for me guys is it's taking the time up front in the consultation. I know Grady's on here and he had mentioned that he talked with the buyer for, for two hours before, unfortunately they told him that they're working with an agent, 
right? We're going to work on that and we're going to teach you, teach you guys just to ask if they're already working with an agent uh, pretty, pretty soon into the process, right? Um, so let's go over this. How do, how do we do that? How do we get this thing down to 20 hours? How do we, how do we set it up for success? And how do we know that when we take them out to go show them houses, they're going to be ready to buy a house. And it's, it's all in my consultation, but let's, let's get up to that consultation, right? We talked about some ways that we, we need to understand how, how we find buyers, but let's, let's say we have that buyer. All right. We have that buyer and they're looking to make this move. One of the first things that we need to understand as an agent is that a seller selling a house can, can create a timeline. They can create their own timeline traditionally, unless they're relocating for a job. But even then, if they're relocating for a job, you, you can help them create their timeline a little easier. A buyer typically is looking to buy a home and they have an outside factor with their timeline. So let me, let me just dive into this for a little bit. A seller has their home, right? They own it. There's no one pushing them out of their home unless they're relocating for a job. If they're relocating for a job, most likely their job gave them enough time, due diligence or ample time to get their home ready on the market, sold and move across country, state, town, whatever it is. So with a seller, usually the timeline is a little easier to navigate and a little easier to do because you're kind of in control because you own it. On a buyer's side, outside factors a lot of times cause a buyer's timeline. So a rental situation and the end of a lease, um, you know, moving into the area and finding the right home after I just sold a home in a different market to buy a home to then move in and then start my new job. Um, to get out of, you know, to, to get out of a, you know, a rental situation where you're living with other people and they're going to continue to stay there, but you need to get out because it's a bad living situation. Buyers don't necessarily understand the timeline it takes because they also haven't gone through it yet. A seller's kind of gone through it. So they know it takes a couple of months. Some buyers thinks it takes six months to a year to buy a home. Other buyers thinks it, they can do it in less than a month. Very, very few buyers that I meet with understand the timeline. So when you first start to talk to a buyer, that's going to be your key number one piece that you want to figure out. So the first step, when you, when you get a buyer lead and you have a name and phone number, you want to ask three questions deep or go real deep with why they feel their timeline is the way it is and help them understand what the buying process is without giving them everything over the phone to a manner in which they feel comfortable with you as well as they understand that, that it is important to meet with you for a consultation and it is important to meet with you for a consultation that, you know, in a timeline that matches up with where they need to be. So kind of, I, I can't stress that enough. And I, and I know I'm, I have a hard time explaining the differences, but when you work with a lot of buyers and you work with a lot of sellers, you'll start to understand quickly what I'm talking about. A, a buyer just more often than not does, has no clue how this works unless they're a seasoned investor and then you don't really have to have much of a consultation anyways, All right? So let's scroll through here. You guys are supposed to be making your calls, daily 10 fours, um, you know, understanding I'm a big handwritten note guy, um, you know, handwritten notes are so powerful. And honestly, more often than not, a handwritten note done correctly and done over time through different means with different potential buyers can also land you those appointments. A buyer wants to feel taken care of. A buyer wants to feel guided and educated. A buyer does not want to be sold. I just truly believe that. You can sell to a buyer and they'll work with you and you can be that hard closer. You're gonna be, you're gonna be that, I believe that if you do that, you're gonna spend more than 50 hours with them. We're here to help them and we're here to guide them and we're here to make them trust us. You're gonna spend less time promise you that. So continue making your calls. Handwritten notes are key and you can hand, send handwritten notes to buyer leads. Now you have to get their, their, their current address, which a lot of us don't ask a buyer all the time, but use it if you have it 
And some of the things that you would want to say into some of your notes is things like I'm just saying right now, I'm here to guide you. I'm here to set up a plan. I want to be a resource for you. Bombard me with questions. This is new to you. Like all of those things you can send out in a handwritten note and they will speak to a buyer. It's nerve wracking to them. And if you take the time out of your day to write them a handwritten note, they're pretty impressed. The other thing about it is, is that um, if you went through our office and, and let's just put a Facebook post out there. When's the last time any of you agents have written a thank you card to a, an awesome buyer lead that you just had? Most of the time people are sending thank yous to sellers because they just already have the address. Buyers aren't receiving them. And if you guys can, can, can kind of one up the competition, it, it becomes no competition. Okay. Nobody else is doing that. And if a buyer lead is talking to another agent, nobody else is doing that. Now, how do you handle that? How do you handle a buyer who is a stranger over the phone and you want to get their, you want to get their mailing address? How do you get that? They don't want to give it to you. Any ideas? Realist? What's that? Oh, no, they would be selling a home then. Never mind. Sorry. I was thinking like public records. No, no, no. no. I'm not saying how do you find it around their back. I'm saying what do, oh. you, what do you tell them? <laughs> this is where I, 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 I added to this class a little bit. I've taught this a lot. And when people go back and they take, take this to practice, they bring back their feedback. And one of the feedbacks I've gotten over the years is, well, when I'm talking to a buyer over the phone and I don't know where to, I don't know where to add the question. What is your, what is your mailing address? And when I, when I finally do, sometimes they're a little confused as to why they, they're a little, they're a little embarrassed about where they live because they live in an apartment or they, you know, they live with their folks in their basement and they just don't really like to talk about that. So how do you get them to do it? You come out of like you're asking them about their living situation. So, you know, be like, where are you living now? Like, how, what is that like? Um, can you give me your address so that I can check your neighborhood out um, so that we can make the changes that need to be changed? Can it just be as simple as, hey, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Buyer, I actually want to send something your way. Uh, what, what's your address? Like, why can't you just say that? Exactly, Darby. What I'm, that's exactly what I'm getting at is don't overcomplicate it right? It's just something that we're not used to. Most of our buyers stuff, we don't tend to ask them where they live. So it's just starting to get used to it. If somebody says, well, I don't really feel comfortable giving you my address. I say, oh, no problem. I was actually just looking to send over some information to you because I know that I'm just a stranger over the phone. And I think it's in your right to do some due diligence around who I am. So if you wouldn't mind, I was just going to send you more of my contact info as well as, um, you know, my, my website. So you can do some research around me and Keller Williams. I, I just wanted to send you some resources because I want you to feel comfortable with who you're working with. You see, the reality is, Mr. And Mrs. Byer, that at some point in time uh, during this phone call, I, I'm going to ask you. You guys still see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Yes. Um, something popped up on me and I thought it was going to shut down. Um, I'm going to ask you, I lost my train of thought. Oh, I think basically, I think you owe it to yourself to understand who you're going to be working with, because at some point in this, in this conversation, I'm going to ask you to meet up with me at my office. And I, I really want to get us started off on the right foot because you need to understand that I'm not just here to sell you a house. I'm here to be a resource to you. And then the first thing that I need to do is I need to get some resources in front of you. And the best resource you're going to have is myself, but I'm just a stranger over the phone currently. So what's a good mailing address for you? I'd just like to send you a little bit of information so you can do diligence on me. So take away every time somebody wants to give you something around the comfortableness let them know that what you're asking them for is to make them feel comfortable, right? If they're not going to give you their, their address, it's because they don't feel comfortable. So how are you going to make them feel comfortable is you're going to allow them to understand that it's just to get to know you. All right. So do your daily 10 4 send handwritten notes to leads, especially buyer leads that you make a great connection with. All right. 
make sure you're tracking. Make sure you're doing all of that. Scripts and role play, right? Appreciate seeing a lot of you guys on scripts. Um, getting your head in the game. You know, this, this is a mind game, right? We always say it. This is a simple industry. It's just not easy. It's not easy to get out of our own way. It's not easy to do the things that we make us feel uncomfortable. Um, but I'm going to make you guys feel comfortable. We're going to make you guys have a good time and fun with a buyer. Buyers are fun. Um, they do. They, they, they oftentimes lie. And it's not that they're lying. It's because a buyer speaks out loud and they're just kind of processing things. We got to help them process it so that way they can connect the dots. Whenever you see a buyer, quote unquote, like miss something or lie, we need to make sure that they understand that their wires are getting crossed in their mind and we need to break, bring them back down to either reality or just help them understand. Sweetheart, the door's open. Thanks. Um, so we get a buyer lead, get them on the phone. We, we want to get as much information as we can, right? We need to pre-qualify them right there over the phone. And we want to make them feel comfortable, but we also got to ask them some uncomfortable questions like Grady experienced, right? So when you're on the phone and when you're setting this appointment, we want to talk about how you're a resource. You want to talk about how you want to ask them for a free consultation and a free home buying seminar. You guys can call it a home buying seminar, home buyer presentation. Um, whatever it is that you think that that person is going to gravitate towards, use those terms, um, you don't have to call it a consultation. You can call it a, a resource presentation. Um, it's like somebody's chiming in here. Give me one sec. Yeah, I, you guys, uh, let me, uh, so Ruby's, Ruby, Ruby's new to Ignite right now. Um, Ruby, here's how you get to these, uh, these slides, okay? Okay. So I want you to go to KW Connect. Mm -hmm. This is the homepage. Go over to the magnifying glass. Type in Ignite. It's going to go down to search results. Usually it's the first one that comes up. Click on the little Ignite uh, icon here. Okay. Then go to materials. And I'm recording this too, Darby, so you, or uh, Ruby, so you can always go back and look. You go to course materials and you scroll down. Now, these first ones are in Canadian uh, or, or from Canada, so they're in French. You're going to scroll down past mission and you want to find the ones that say student. So we are on Power Session 7, find and win the buyer, student version 4.17. Click on that, and then it pulls open this, this PDF of 79 pages. Thank you. Yeah, good question. And you don't have to put it in the chat because I'm horrible with trying to figure that out. Just shout it out to the rooftops. You interrupt me anytime. I don't care. Thanks. So, so we're landing this appointment, right? We're on the phone, and we need to make a buyer feel comfortable. Most buyers do not have any sort of reservations around meeting with you but they will ask you if it's something that you can do over the phone. They will ask you if you could just send them or email them the material. I usually don't find a whole lot of objections with them wanting to know more about the home buying process. The objection comes from them wanting to meet you in person. The injection comes from similar to a seller, right? Just send me everything and then I'll decide if you want, if I want to have you come over to my house. So even with a buyer, the objections that we have are just, just simply meeting with them. So how do we handle that, right? How do we handle a buyer who's like, nah, I'm good. I, I really don't need a consultation. Um, I'm just going to pick on some of the Nelson guys. Do the, has the Nelson team taught you guys how to, how to respond to, to not wanting an appointment? Yeah, uh, kind of, yeah. What's that? Kind of. Kind of? You want to try it? Let's try it. I appreciate you volunteering. You and Jeffrey, I always pick on. Um, so, you know, hey, man, I, I, you know, I just, I'm not 100% sure if, if I really am looking to meet with you, Brady. Um, I think I pretty much know what's going on uh, with the buying process. I just need somebody to help me get in the doors. 
Okay, well, tell me why, why, why is it that you're thinking that way, Bruce? Perfect. Why is that important to you? Well, because, um, you know, I've got some money, you know, I've got my lender, you know, I've got my lender, we're almost wrapped up with that. But, you know, I just, there's a couple houses I just don't want to miss out on. And it feels like if we meet up, you know, they could be gone from what I'm hearing in this market. Well, that could be true. But, you know, there are some, some avenues that I can give you, which is why I do want to meet with you, because I am able to see some of those properties that are not on the market through the MLS. So, that meeting could be vital to you in seeing those properties that you may not be able to see through Zillow or some other websites. Very good. Now I'm going to come at, I'm going to be hard on you, man. Cause that was good. Well, that makes sense. Why can't you just tell me it over the phone? Um, you know, you can take down my criteria and let me know if you find any off market properties and we can meet up at them. Well, I think the important thing is that we meet in person so that you get to know me as a person and I kind of get to know you that way. It's not just, over the phone, you'll kind of get a good vibe for who I am and, and how I can help you throughout this. Nice. Well, I'll be honest with you, man. You sound pretty trustworthy to me. I really don't have any issues with that. So um, if it's just to meet, so we get to know each other, man, I, I, I just, it's no offense to you. I just, I don't really care who you are. It sounds like you're a good guy and it sounds like you know your stuff. Right on. Okay. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we set up something at just like a Starbucks, just to have a cup of coffee and chat for a little bit. Okay, I'm going to pause you right there. Awesome. If they're resistant and they're resistant, use that tactic, right? You can say, hey, well, you know what? No problem. I have a few things that I seriously need to go over with you before we go out uh, and see these homes. We, need, we, got, we got to understand what, what the world of real estate's doing as far as the homes go. So I'll tell you what, um, give me some of those addresses and I'll find a Starbucks right down the street from them. So instead of taking, you know, some time to, to meet at the office and whatnot, you're right. Let's just hit two birds with one stone. Let's, uh, let's meet at the coffee shop for about 10, 15 minutes. I'll talk to you about kind of what we're going to see and what we're seeing in real estate and homes, such as microphones and cameras being in there, such as, you know, lights and what to touch and what not to touch. And, you know, things, things are a little different than they were when, you know, your parents bought the home or when you bought your last home or whatever that is, right? So that's a good tactic too. Um, let me give you a little deeper thought into this. The reason why, if you ask some basic questions around the home buying process that nobody knows, that's when you can get somebody to get in for an appointment. Okay. Okay. So you did really, really good, but ask more questions instead of statements. So, so let's reverse roles on the agent. You're the, you're, okay. the, uh, you're the buyer. You're pretty resistant Brady on wanting to come in. I've already tried some of the first things that I did. Now, what I would ask you now is, oh, Brady, you know, hey, man, I get that a lot. And, and the reason why I've learned consultations are so important, it's, it's much like when you go to a doctor's office. When you first go to a new doctor, you meet first at the office. Before you see the doctor, they have you fill out this questionnaire. You see, the reality is, Brady, we can do a lot of this over the phone. But I don't know about you, but I have some visuals that I want to show you. So just talking to you over the phone may not help in, help it sink in all the way. Um, I have a few, few questions for you. If you answer these to the nine, Brady, I'm happy to go meet you at a house. Um, but if we don't know some of these things, I, I really want to make sure we go over them. Brady, do you, know, do you know if you're looking to buy a $400,000 house and I asked you to, to submit earnest money on that property when you make an offer, do you know how much earnest money you're going to need to have? And do you know what earnest money is and how it, it's held? I've heard of it, but I don't really know exactly what it is, I guess. Okay. So that's the sort of type of things that we're going to really hone in on and go over. But I I'll give you this one free of charge over the phone here, Brady. Earnest money is basically what I'm going to call your skin in the game. It's, it's, a, it's a deposit that you put down with the contract to basically hold your place in line so no one else can take you out of first position. It shows good faith to the seller. And it's typically around 1% of the purchase price. Now, here's the key, Brady. I want you to know that you're going to be putting this money up front, but I, I want you to understand that it's going to go in escrow, meaning you're not just paying 1% to make an offer. It's actually part of your down payment. You see, stuff like this, Brady, is exactly what we'll talk about in detail. And I actually have some more stuff that I would go over with you about earnest money. But better yet, 
the other question I want to ask you, man, is, is the appraisal process. Do you know how the appraisal process works? And do you know what happens once an appraisal happens um, if the property appraises over the value of the contract price? No, I don't. You, you see, man, and that's exactly why I really feel like we need to sit down and we need to meet. You see, I've done this so many times. And as a professional, I, I'm much like the doctor. I know that it's not in my best wishes or your best uh, case to just come in and, and meet me at a house, right? You don't come into your doctor when you're sick and just meet with them if it's the first time you've ever been there. The doctor needs to understand and they need to go over some things about you so they can best help you. Similar to myself, I need to make sure we go over this stuff in person because the home buying process is, is, is quite daunting. And if we understand it, we can still have some fun. You do want to have fun while you're looking at homes, don't you? Absolutely. Right. So would, would Friday at five work or blah, 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 blah. So just pick out two things that you're an expert on in the home buying process and ask them those one-off questions, right? You notice how I, I didn't say, well, if, if the appraisal comes in at a lower price than contract price, what happens? Right. Most of the time people say, Oh, I just want to pay whatever it's worth. And that's the way the contract is written. Right. Nobody knows what happens when it appraises for over contract price. So pick out some, some of those nuances. Um, I use, I use inspection. You know, do you know how an inspection works? Do you know that an inspector does not test for mold? Do you know that an inspector, uh, it's an add on to do a sewer scope. Do you know how much an inspection generally costs in our area? Did you know that an inspection cost is over and above? It's money out of your pocket at the time of inspection. You see, I have so many things that we need to go over. And, and unfortunately, without being in person, without having some of my visuals, I will never know if we actually hit everything over the phone because we're just kind of chatting. I mean, I'm going to have my visuals in front of me, but I'm going to make sure that you understand this so that way we can have some fun out there. Um, you do stuff like that and you'll never have an issue getting uh, somebody to commit to a consultation. A question. I like how you, you also kind of used, even before you threw out those two questions, kind of used his own words against him. And you just said, you know, Hey, you know, um, I forget what it is exactly that you said. You said, um, well, let me just do this. Let me pull up those two houses that you're looking at and I'll bring that information with me and I can kind of go over like, you know, what that all entails. So you kind of just used what he was saying against him in some ways. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cool, yep. Cool. So are, is it pretty okay if we move on to the consultation? Okay. I'm going to go over briefly the consultation, but we're going to do, we're going to record another class around the full blown consultation. But this is how I really start to set the expectations with buyers. This is how I win them over. This is how I get them to commit to a buyer's agency with me. Um, this is how I really make sure that they understand who I am. They understand the process and that we lead the horses in front of the cart instead of the cart in front of the horse. Buyers, they're, they're just known for that. They always want to put that cart in front of the horse every time, all the time. It doesn't matter. So let me just scroll down here. This one I kind of know like the back of my hand so we don't pay attention much. Oh, okay. This is actually good. So before we have the consultation, much like a seller, we need to, we need to gather some information. All right. One, if you know their name, use social media to your advantage. Go stalk that individual. We need to try to figure out who our audience is. Number two, Let's have some stats ready, all right? I encourage you guys to have some stats ready for different price points. If you know the average price point in a, any given area, there's a couple of things that really help a buyer start to click and understand our market. And the stat is called the list to sales price ratio. So you definitely want to know an average price point for the area or county or just Denver Metro. Like I, I keep saying, and I know this is different in Loveland and it's a little different in Fort Collins, but I generalize the average price point in Longmont. When I speak, you're mainly going to hear me talk about the average price point. 
and I say in our area, in the northern Denver metro. And, and it's just because the average price point doesn't really mean beans to the person you're talking to because they're either going to be on the underneath the average price point or above the average price point. If they're dead on the nose, it's kind of odd, right? So they're either under or over it. And, and you just want to talk about that once they get their pre-approval. But better yet, if you know the average sales price point, I encourage you to know what the average list to sales price is below the average price point. And then I want you to know the average list to sales price point above the average sales price point and generalize it. But the reality is, is right now in our market, are we not seeing, are we, are, are we, or are we not seeing multiple offers on any given house that is about, it's, if it's taken care of and it's under 450, 500,000 in our area right now, it's hard to compete. There's a lot of offers happening, which means that when there's multiple offers, it means this, the demand is, or the demand is high, possibly supply is low, which causes us to make more off, make an offer over list price, which also causes then that stat to be at maybe a hundred to 102 to 103% list to sales price ratio. So if you go over the purchase price, and that means you're paying over 100% of what was advertised, which means when the averages come out, anything under the average price point in an area traditionally sells for 99.5 and above right now. If it's a $300,000 house, you might see 106%. If it's a $500,000 house, you might see 99.5. And any time in between there, you might see 101, 102. But if we know that stat and we are able to explain it to our buyers, boom, we're making them feel comfortable with the understanding that just because the price that they see online doesn't mean that's the price they're going to pay. And it also tells them that if they get pre-approved for an, uh, something that's you know an average price point, they need to expect to give the seller list price or above. And then when you can say these stats and you can directly relate to that with them during your consultation and you go out and you show them houses and they want to make an offer. I can't remember the last time I had a buyer's consultation with somebody who understood everything, shook their head. Yes. Went out and looked at a property and then wanted to undercut somebody. I can't remember the last time they usually make a great offer the first time around for me. Now, they might not be super comfortable with their first offer putting in all these other special clauses around appraisal deficits and inspections and, and escalation clauses. But mark my words, I never have a hard time with them coming in at list price or above because that one stat, that one stat explained right can really help a buyer understand what they're going to need to do for you out in the market. And if you don't talk about the market and you don't know that stat and you can't relay that to them in layman's terms, you're going to be the agent that shows them five or seven homes because of the other things we're going to teach you. But you're also going to be the agent that shows them instead of, you know, 10, 20, 30 houses, you might show them 50 to 70 because the first offer they make is 25 K under list price when there's four offers on the table. Right? So be careful with that and understand that, 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 that stat. What are, what are some other stats you think a buyer should know? Average time on the market. Yes. What else? There's one other one that I kind of think of with a buyer. Would it be like um, how many offers we might have to put in before one gets accepted? I don't know. Well, I don't know if there's a stat around that, but yes, I talk about that for sure. What about your average list to sales ratio? That's a good one. I don't use mine because it sucks. <laughs> I don't have one. So. <laughs> well, and, and the reality is, is that if the market is averaging 101, 102% of list price and a buyer wants to get into a home, I'm educating them to put in an offer of 104%. So my average sales list of sales price is not very great because I was a buyer's agent for a long time in a seller's market. 
And, you know, my pride and joy is that I got homes sold in a seller's market. That's so you're not wrong, but I don't use mine. Average price of uh, homes in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. If you know the neighborhood, what I'm looking for is uh, when you start to talk about a, a heavy seller's market to a buyer, that scares them. So we need to, we need to tone it down and we need to make them understand that it is still the right time to buy, right? You don't want to set too much expectation to the point where you scare them off. So this one last stat that I like to talk about is I like to go in to um, Iris or Ari, Colorado, and I like to pull numbers around how many homes were listed in the last week and how many homes went under contract in the last week. Because what I've been noticing is even in a seller's market, a lot of homes go under contract quickly, but a lot more homes come on the market just as, as just the same. If you get, if you look at any one given week in our market right now, it seems like if 20 homes went on the market last week, another 18 to 22 homes sold last week and week after week, it seems very similar month after month. So, what a buyer needs to understand is, is that homes are coming on the market just as fast as they're being sold. So I don't mean to scare you, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. I just want to give you the reality that it's a great time to buy. And if it wasn't a good time to buy, there wouldn't be that many buyers out there looking at homes. So I know we just got done talking about all the scary stuff around, you know, multiple offers and and things of that nature. And I really don't want that to scare you. I just want that. I just want you to know that if we're looking to accomplish home ownership, it's completely possible as long as you're willing to understand the market. And, and the way I understand the market is, is there's just as many homes coming on the market as there are coming off the market. We just, we don't really have necessarily an inventory problem. What we have is we have a lot of demand. You see in our area right now, we're selling more homes than we ever have before. And we're still in a seller's market, but what that means is that there's just more buyers than there are listings, but there's still a heavy amount of listings out there. So when we're out there, don't get discouraged if one of those houses that you want to see today is gone by tomorrow, because the reality is, is that you're just getting started and mark my words, there's going to be another property that you fell in love with. If you already fell in love with the property before you even talked with me or before you even have lender pre-approval, the reality is, is another one's going to pop up. And because of our consultation today, we're going to be ready to, we're going to be ready to jump on that house. That sound good? Yada, 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 yada. Right? So talk about those stats and, and, and make them understand, right? So some stats help them understand and create the expectation, but it also can scare the bejesus out of people. So we need to, then I end it with toning it down and making them understand that just because the market is that way and just because I'm telling you that when you see a house you like, we need to go out and see it tomorrow or, or that day. Doesn't mean it's still not possible and doesn't mean that it's still not going to be fun. Okay. I, I don't really use any other stats, but I, I know there's a lot of people that use all sorts of stats. Um, I, I pretty much average price point, list the sales price, days on market, and um, the, the, the basically home sales or how many are coming on the market as well as selling. And as long as those numbers are still aligning, it's a great, it's a great pitch to a buyer for sure. All right. Oh, here we go. List to sales price ratio, days on market, average days on market, BINs IDX. I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, where do you get the stats? MLSs pull different things, right? Um, in Ari, Colorado, they have uh, what they call a um, a market watch. So I'll just show it to you here. How how bad is that going to stink for me if this market watch doesn't show exactly what I was just talking about? It's going to be like zero homes went under contract or it's going to be like 20,000 homes went under contract and no new listings. <laughs> it is a little off. Look at this. 
So new market watch, new listings. Can you guys see my screen? New listings, there were 89 new listings and 162 listings went pending. Now I have this over a, a running seven days. So today is Wednesday. This is running back from last Wednesday. So from last Wednesday to today, 89 new listings hit the market and 162 listings went under contract. So that's a little, little backwards from what I was talking about, but it's still, that's still a massive amount of listings. Now, I want you guys to also challenge this because here's what also happened. You take 89 plus 31 and you're right around 120. So you're only off by maybe 30 to 40 because the back on market is another key indicator. Just because everything's going under contract quickly doesn't mean we don't have a mass amount of things falling apart right now because of COVID, job losses, buyers getting very excited, and then all of a sudden, boom, they're making an offer on a house, they, then they wake up the next morning and realize they don't want anymore. Here's another interesting one. We had 51 price decreases. So we have a lot of things selling, but we also have 51 homes that had price decreases. It means that agents are overpriced in houses. Even in a seller's market, they don't sell. So you guys know these things and use these tools in, in the MLSs. Any questions? All right. Qualifying, we already talked about qualifying the buyer for the consultation, right? That, that's that pre-qualifying script that we talked about over the phone. Uh, this is, I kind of like to talk about this too a little bit right in here, right before we like really go into the consultation. We need to understand the difference between being a buyer and being for homes. All right. When you go shopping, it means you don't have to buy a home that day, or it means you don't have to buy something that day, right? Right? If you're just going to go shopping for a new pair of shoes, but you don't need a new pair of shoes, you may or may not become a buyer that day. You're just you're testing the market. You're feeling it out. When you need a pair of shoes, when you blow out the, the, the toes or the shoes or the sole comes off or the glue comes apart or whatever that is, right? Um, you, you snag it on a, a nail on the deck and you tear a, 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 a seam down the side. You become a buyer the next time you go out to look for shoes, right? So think back to yourself and think back to when you wanted to do something and you need to purchase a commodity, when it came down to the point of buying, when you actually decided this is what I'm gonna do, that's when you were a buyer that day. But you probably had other days of shopping, right? Doing research online looking for those tennis shoes, figuring out if you're going to go to finish line, Dick's, Walmart, you name it, boot barn, where you're going to go, right? That was when you were shopping. When you decided where you were going to go buy, you still might not walk into that store the first time and buy that day. We need to understand that a buyer, we need to get a buyer to a place where they're buying a home. We don't want to get a buyer to a place where they're still just shopping after we're done. Right? So use that analogy. Think about that when a buyer is answering questions for you and ask them more questions to get them to be a buyer by the time the consultation's over, allow them to shop online. So when I go through my consultation, you're going to hear me talk about making sure that they understand. I, my, one of my famous lines is, oh, I, I'm not the agent that hates Zillow. If you want to use Zillow, use it. I like when people use Zillow. I like to train them to shop on Zillow and buy through the MLS. If you discourage people from using sources that are online, if you discourage people from shopping – because you, you can negatively talk about a website, then you're going to be the one helping them shop, right? Don't spend your time shopping with people. Spend your time helping them buy, and, and it'll, set, it'll set you guys on fire. So 
I really encourage you that even if you don't care for Zillow, not to say that. Encourage them to tell them the ins and outs about Zillow. Make them have that doubt around Zillow, but encourage them to use it because it, it'll save you time out there because they'll understand the market faster. The more information they can give to themselves online, the faster they're ready to make a commitment with you when you're out shopping or buying a home instead of shopping. Any questions on the difference between buyer and a, and a shopper? Okay. Hey, do you have time? Do you have time, Bruce, to uh, to briefly kind of highlight the ins and outs of Zillow? Uh, Jeffrey, always, my friend. Always. Yeah. yeah, of course. All right. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I literally touched my chest in the video, and that's exactly what I do during the consultation. Is I'll tell someone, I'll tell a buyer, look. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, there's a lot of third-party websites out there, and I'm not the type of agent that's going to discourage you from using one or another. I don't know if you know this, but Redfin is actually owned by a real estate company, and I think they have a very cool app. I'm a real estate agent telling you this because what I understand is, is that that app is powerful, just like a Zillow, just like a Trulia, and the reality is, is that there's multiple third-party websites because your personality is going to gravitate towards one or another. I encourage you to use what you know, but when it comes down time, what I really need you to know, Jeffrey, is that the MLS system that I use is going to kind of have more of the, more of the up-to-date information around that type of property. So would you do me a favor, and if you use Redfin, if you use Zillow, and you see an address that you like, if I didn't send that to you through the MLS, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to send me that address as soon as you know it. Because the reality is, Jeffrey, that if I have your search set up wrong and you're not receiving the information that you want to receive, then I need to tweak that search so that way we can always stay on the same page. But more often than not, Jeffrey, if I find that you send me an address that's not necessarily in my MLS system, chances are it may be something that's already under contract it may be a for sale by owner, or it may be something that's called a pre-foreclosure. You see, Zillow and Trulia and Redfin, they're third-party websites, meaning third-party websites do what? They do advertising. And the reason why they're able to offer that website to you as the consumer for free is because they need people like agents and companies through the real estate realm to pay for their website. So it's free to you, but free comes at a cost. And, and there may not be all of the information. But I'm here to tell you that they have some slick websites. And I encourage you, if you're using them, feel free to. But make sure you send me everything that you don't see me send you. And we can talk around the rhyme and reason why maybe I didn't send it to you. Or talk around the rhyme and reason why we need to change your search. Does that make sense? That was magical. Great. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I, that's how I explain it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm putting that doubt in their mind that it's not going to give them all the information they're ever going to want and that I'm the gatekeeper of that information. And that's why you're still going to use me to buy a home, but I'll never bash those third party websites because they work and they're, you know, big in the world for a reason. And I can't, I, can't, I can't take that away from them. But what I can take away from them is, is my client registering on their website to go show a house with them because I didn't send it to them, right? That's the last thing you want to happen is they find a house online that you didn't send them and it makes them think that because you didn't send them, they need to go see the house with someone else. Make sure your buyers understand that. See, that's, that's why we get so frustrated with buyers is because buyers have – Apps, they have like literally no clue how this works. I mean, it, it is, it is, you meet some of the smartest people in the world. Janet Eager, Janet Eggers on here? Yes, she is. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> yes, you are. Janet just got done working with a, a real estate attorney in, in Arizona. And I, will, I was stunned. Usually when I work with a real estate attorney, it can be a difficult process because they're very analytical. 
this guy was a real estate attorney asking us pretty rookie questions, basically making Janet second guess why he was asking these questions. Very intelligent guy, real estate attorney asking us some very novice um, base questions. So it doesn't matter the profession. It just seems like unless we are there to tell them about how this works, they have no clue. So you got to talk about all points to, uh, I think Grady's still on here. To Grady's point, I heard him say he had a, you know, a two hour conversation with somebody. My consultations are two hours. They started off being an hour long. And then I realized you can't get through everything in one hour. Then they started being more like an hour and a half to two hours, depending upon my, my client's questions. I'm very long winded. And by spending two hours up front, I can tell you will save you at least here's, here's, here's why I save myself. And I go from about 50 hours for a buyer to about 20. You can save yourself about 10 hours of time out there showing them property. If you can set your buyer's consultation up to be about an hour and a half to two hours. It's, it's imperative for my business. Now, if I spend that time with them up front, I won't spend that much time with them on the back end. And it's because I explained Zillow. I explained third-party websites and all of those things. So good, good question. Any other questions before we just like kind of, again, I'm gonna kind of give you my outline of the buyer's presentation. Cool, we'll move right along. So my buyer's presentation. You guys, you guys heard me talk a bunch and I, I'm very, I, I'm, I'm all about that first impression. I'm all about if you nail the intro to any presentation, it doesn't matter how much you know or don't know or fumble through the rest. Because when you set that precedence, they very likely start to trust you right off the rip because you're the professional. It's the same thing with my analogy of going into the doctor's office. You don't go into a doctor's office and demand to see the doctor right away. There's a process. You sign in, you wait, the practitioner or or takes you back or somebody takes you back. They take your temperature, your vitals. Then you wait a little longer and then you see the doctor. We don't question that process because it's, it's very similar. Doctors became that way. Do you guys understand doctors are self-employed business owners and they all pretty much run the same way because they realized that's the best way they know to save them time. Us as real estate agents, unfortunately, hate to say it, but there's a, there's a lot of us out there. There's a lot of us out there just riding by the seat of our pants, which means the general population doesn't expect that same type of thing. So we have to make sure that we set that precedence. When I walk into a doctor's office, they don't really have to tell me how it's going to go. I can just expect it. With a buyer and a seller in these presentations that we do, they don't really know what to expect all the time, especially somebody that's worked with three different agents. I bet you every single one of those agents did something a little differently. So we got to nail those intros. We got to make sure that they understand there's a process to our, our system and that we're doing it in a manner in which it's going to save both of us time. So first thing I do on a buyer's presentation is I, I, I thank them for having me over or I thank them for coming into the office. I thank them for meeting me at a coffee shop. I get them their coffee. I want to make sure that they feel comfortable. So I always, 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 sounds, it sounds like a kid, right? Go to the bathroom before you get in the car. Always make sure that I ask them if they need to use the restroom before we get started. Now, here's the key. If you guys are nervous, go use the restroom. Calm yourself down. Splash some water in your face. If you guys are nervous, go grab that extra cup of water at Starbucks. If you're at the office, which I hope we can get back to soon, go grab a water for yourself, even if, you're, even if your buyers don't want it, right? But make sure you offer that to them. Make sure they get to a comfortable place when you get started because... It's a long-winded conversation for an hour and a half. Then the next thing I do is I, I set them at ease again by letting them know that we're only going to go over three main things today. And I do the same thing for a seller. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, first and foremost, I know that coming in here, you might have a, a, a litany of questions to ask me. I want to go ahead and I want to tackle your questions first and foremost with a little precursor. If it's something that we're going to talk about a little later, I'll let you know that, okay? The secret is, is that I'm gonna talk about everything later, so I'm probably not even gonna answer any questions right now, right? So I'm gonna go over and I'm, I wanna go, I wanna get these, all these questions off of your chest 
And I want you to make, I want to make sure that you understand we're going to tackle everything you need to know today. Number two, the other thing that, that's going to be on your chest, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, that I have to get you off, I have to get this off your mind. Because if you didn't get this off your mind, when we go over the home buying process, you're going to have so many questions and so many things that you want to just spill out to me. So the second part that we're going to do is we're going to go over your criteria. We're going to talk a little more in depth around what it is that you're looking to accomplish. And then third, we're going to end with the home buying process. And by the end of this and by the end of the home buying process, we're going to choose whether or not we decide to work together. I'm going to choose whether I'm going to take you on as a buyer and, I'm, and you're going to choose whether or not you're going to take me on as your agent. See, we need to feel comfortable in this and this is a relationship. So I'm going to make this easy on you and let's just start with number one. Talk to me. Tell me what kind of questions you have coming in here. And then boom, I tackle their questions and I'll tell you guys about 90% of all the questions they have is, oh, yeah, oh, you know what? Let's talk more in depth about this in, during the home buying process. But yeah, you need, you need to talk to a lender first before we go out and look at homes. And I'll explain why later. So I'll sort of answer their question, but I'll table it. Is there anything else you'd like to ask me? Literally everything that they have to ask you, if your presentation is done correctly, you will never have any questions that you'll not hit down the road in the consultation, unless it's one of those just absolute crazy ones like, well, I got a question about this house. Like, I'm not prepared for that, right? So write down the, write down the address, let them know, that, or you know, look up the house right then and there, answer those questions. And if they start asking more and more questions about that house, just say, yeah, we're going to get into all of that. that that's, that's why I'm going to do this. What other kind of questions do you have? So again, it's just a, a little simple thing, takes about you know, two to three minutes, makes them feel very comfortable with you and really allows them to speak their mind. And then here's the key, you guys. Got to write this down. You got to put this in your memory bank because I watch people take my class. I watch people and I shadow people on their, on their consultations and they skip right over this question part because they, they, forget the, they forget the mindset behind it. It's a mind game we're playing, guys. By them asking their questions, you're freeing up brain space for them to be able to listen to you better, but better than even that. The reason why you want them to ask questions is because guaranteed, I've, I still have not been wrong on this. The first or second question that they ask you is of most importance to them and it's of most importance to tackle. And it's the most important thing that you're going to focus on usually that day. So if somebody asks me about how the lending process works, instantly I have to, this is where you can get a little judgy, like a little judgmental around things, right? You can jump to conclusions. Somebody asked me, well, how does the lending process work? And do you have lenders I can talk to? Then that means they might be nervous about the down payment they have. They might be nervous about their credit score. They might be nervous that they don't have all the documentation in order for them to get pre-approved, right? There's something about that, that lending that really strikes home to them. They might be a frugal individual who doesn't really care to spend a lot of money. And so they wanna know that if buying a house is gonna wipe out their savings account, they're gonna to wanna to know how that process works. And so they might ask about lending. Um, you got another buyer who might ask about you know, different homes. That buyer probably is pushed for time. That buyer probably needs to get into something sooner rather than later. So you might have to talk about the timeline and how the process, the Brighton process matches up with their timeline and give them the expectation of when to talk to a lender. And by this date, we need to be pre-approved. By this date, we need to be under contract. So you're going to probably walk their timeline backwards. But understand, guys, the first couple of questions that come out of someone's mouth is the most important thing that you're going to want to tackle and it's the most important details you're going to want to give them. Okay. You, you will really set people on fire and you'll leave that consultation with them going, wow, he, they really helped me. They really helped me today. Even if you didn't tackle half of what you wanted to, as long as you tackled their big rocks, 
they're going to feel like you're t they're taken care of. All right. So you ask them, you ask them what their questions are, understand the mentality around why questions are important and why the first couple of them are most important. Darby, I, we're not going to go over it here on this one, but you know, in scripts today, we talked about that and why at her listing appointment, he asked those questions and it turned out to be his primary goal was to get somebody to bring a buyer and go under contract. Um, but it, it's important. Okay. The second thing, the second piece, right? We're going to step right into section two. This is where, again, my, my consultations are an hour and a half, but within the first five minutes, I thank them a bunch of times for coming in. I grab them some water. We go to the bathroom. We answer some questions. And within five minutes, I'm already on step two. Step two, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, we're going to be going into this. And we're going to talk about the home buying process. Or I'm so sorry. We're going to talk about what it is you're looking for in a home. We're going to go over your criteria. So Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, tell me a little bit more about your situation. And as soon as I ask that question, I've got my lead sheet pulled up here. I have this lead sheet in a more of a condensed version and I like a one pager. But these are all questions that you're going to want to make sure you go through and ask them during this, this little phase of what I call the discovery phase around what they're looking for, the criteria phase, the, the piecing it all together type of thing. On your buyer's lead sheet or your buyer's intake sheet, I don't really care what it looks like. Just, just make sure it's an outline in which you flow very well with. And you got to make sure, and you're going to notice on here, there's three main things that they tackle. Contact info, buyer's criteria around the home they're looking for, and lending or money. You have those three things and have questions around them, you'll, be, you'll, you'll, set, you'll set yourself up for success. Now, the other thing I wanna to talk to you guys about with this or in regards to this is during this process, this is where I really, really, really hone in on who am I talking to and the type of personality I'm dealing with. And what I use guys is called the DISC profile. D-I-S-C, and we're going to pause a little bit on this, on this buyer's lead sheet, and we're going to talk about the DISC profile for a little bit. Can you guys still hear me if I sit away from the computer a little bit? Cool. So the DISC profile is one of the things that I was trained, I went to a training on, and I didn't realize how much it was going to help me learn who I am, but better yet, I didn't realize how much the DISC profile was going to help me win people over if I could figure out what type of personality they are. You guys, I'm, I am, I don't think I've ever admitted this over, over, over this, uh, over any sort of training yet, but you guys, I'm the epitome of somebody who, before I started this industry, I could not stand all of you type A personalities out there. You guys know what I'm talking about by type A personality? Type A is like direct, dominant, to the point. People of few words, the grumbly people, or that I would, I still call them the grumbly people because I condition myself to think that type A is just don't want to talk to me. The reality is, is type A is just, they don't want to talk to anybody because they don't like to talk. They just want to get to the point and get on with life. Well, the, in the DISC profile, understanding that a D, the high Ds, you're going to hear me talk about high and low and blah, blah, blah. In the DISC profile, D, I, S, and C, the majority of people have two different natural types of people that they are, all right? So somebody who has naturally a high D in their personality or they're at a high level type A, they have pros and cons, just like any personality has a pro and con. Let's talk about this a little bit. So a high D, we already know they're type A. A lot of people can relate when I say type A, but a high D is dominant. They're direct. They're the drivers. They're to the point. They're the people that take charge. They're the people that 
when they're sitting around a group of people that aren't doing anything are very inactive or aren't accomplishing anything or type A's hate, absolutely hate focusing on the problem. They need to be in an environment where they focus on the solution. To a type A or a high D, focusing on the problem doesn't get you anywhere and they need to get going. They need to speed up things. They're in and out type of people. Now, that's their, their pros are that they do very good business because they don't waste time. They make decisions like that. They recover from bad decisions quickly. A type A is not afraid to make a decision because if it's the wrong decision, they're very quick to pivot and change and go to the next. High Ds and type A's. You guys ever seen somebody kind of make a lot, do very successful very quickly and then lose it all and then gain it right back? It's because what got them to the point where they gained a lot also is what caused them to lose it all, but is also what causes them to be able to persevere and, and gain back. And it's really because a type A, they don't give a crap about the problem. The only thing that they care about the problem is how the problem came to be. And the only thing they want to talk about is how they can solve that problem. Because if, if a high D understands that they can solve problems, that's how they're successful. Most successful people aren't very good in their craft. They're very good at solving people's problems, which makes them a lot of money. So now what are the weaknesses behind a high D? After what I just told you, and I know we're in, we're in this, 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 Zoom environment, so I'm just going to give it to you. A high D's weakness is that they're off-putting to people that aren't high D's. That's me. High D's used to really put me off. I used to not ever want to be friends with a high uh, uh, type A because I didn't think they were friendly. I didn't think they could have a side to them where they could be down to earth and real, right? Us as human beings, we like to talk about problems because it helps us vent, helps us get it off our chest and off our mind. Well, a high D doesn't like to, so it seems like they're hard to make friends with. Also, a high D, it can seem like they don't have time for you. If you guys interrupt me, if you guys interrupt me when I am in go mode, when I'm in lead generation mode and I have 20,000 things on my plate, you're going to wonder if something's wrong with me that day. You're going to wonder if, oh, this gives me a great example. Ruby, you still on here? Yeah. <laughs> I awesome. was just asked you that. <laughs> Ruby, doesn't, Ruby doesn't know me very well yet. She's getting to know me. And most of Ruby and I's interactions have been on my secondary personality. So um, I'm a high D and a high S. And I'm also like, you read my disc profile, I'm a, I'm a chameleon. I can adapt to any, I can adapt to any of them very well, but in my natural state, when I coach and I train and I mentor and I do these things, I'm a high S and we'll get to what that is. But when I'm lead generating and I'm in business mode and I have eight coaching calls, three different in, up, inspections I got to deal with and two new buyer leads or seller leads that I need to tackle and input and, and data entry. You're going to get Brewster in the high D mode. And I'm not real pleasant in the high D mode because what it is, is that most people see me on my other side. And so when you get me in my high D mode, most people will think something's wrong. So the other week, I think maybe it was last week or the other week, Ruby and I were spending a lot of time together, getting her up and running. And then one day she needed me and it was a day where I had, 30 different things going on at one time. And she asked me for a, a lender's contact info. And it probably took me an hour or two to get back to you. And all I did was go online, copy and paste that lender's info, send it over to her. And I didn't say a word to her. I got on to my next project. And without skipping a beat, Ruby is a, Ruby's a high S. And we'll talk about what a high S is, but Ruby's a high S. She cares about what's wrong with me. She sends me a text message that says, 
I hope everything's going okay in your day. Or some, she said, I hope everything's going okay. Is there anything wrong? Is there anything I can do for you? She's very consoling. She's very caring. And she has a lot of high S in her. She didn't know that I was in high D mode. She didn't know it wasn't her. I just needed to answer her question and get on because I had about four other people I needed to answer their questions to. So a high D can be off-putting because it can seem like something's wrong, especially when, when a type A turns it on. So their weaknesses are that it's hard for them to relate to people. And better yet, the biggest weakness of a high D is that they don't feel emotion. They don't show emotion. When they feel emotion, you'll never really know. High Ds are the types at, at funerals, at their parents' funeral, that don't budge a tear. Deep down inside, they're, they're crying. Deep down inside, their stomach's turning. But on the outside, they're very stoic. And it's because over time, they've developed that stoicness. They've developed the, the personality that says, in order for me to be successful, I can't show my emotion all the time. And so it can be hard to relate to a high D because you don't, it's not hard to relate to a high D. It's just high Ds make you not feel comfortable with asking emotional questions. So we're going to quit beating up on high Ds for a sec because I like to beat up on the high I's. Who, let me see who the high I's are in the room. I'm just going to see. And I want you guys to take this disc profile. Oh, just a little, little precursor. Melissa, you're laughing. <laughs> I love the disc profile. Melissa Brashers is on here and she knows that. Go to Tony Ro or Google Tony Robbins disc profile and take the free version. Take the free version. You don't have to pay for this because even the free version will tell you more than you want to know about yourself. Okay. Sarah, go ahead. I think that's Sarah. It is. Hey, uh, I ha can you guys hear me first off? Yes. All right, cool. Make sure my mic's working. Um, I've actually taken this in school. Um, I took a coaching and performance course when I was in college, and I actually had to take the disc profile. Um, so I have it pulled up now. So as you're like talking about like being really heavily like the D or like the dominant um, out of the disc profile, I'm like reading all about it. I'm like, yep, that fits. <laughs> yes, it does. So I don't know you yet, but you seem like a driver and you seem like a... I don't know. You seem actually pretty well balanced, Sarah. Um, I think your D probably spikes a little bit and you probably have a little bit of IS in you as your secondary. What is your, what does your disc profile say? So I am naturally really heavily uh, persuasive. So it's I. Um, so yeah, I'm actually not even close to the D, which I thought was interesting because I thought my personality would be closer to dominant and it's, I'm actually extensively persuasive and like extroverted. So I actually follow in the I category, but my adapted style. So like when I am kind of in work mode, I actually adapt into three categories. So I'm actually a CSI. So I'll be, um, more conscientious and I like structure and then I'm also supportive and persuasive, but I'm not dominant like at all. That was actually my lowest category, which I was really surprised. Well, and let me talk to you about that too. So I, I took a bunch of classes and that's probably why you're, you're like a chameleon. So you under, yeah, you're like a chameleon. So if you have, if you have naturally three, three things that are a little higher, then the, the algorithm behind the profile, it basically has to put something else down. Because when you take the disc profile, it asks you questions with four answers. And so if you tend to answer more on three different levels, then naturally there's usually one that spikes down. It's, it's hard to find somebody that's a level across the board because naturally if you are level across the board, there's always one that goes a little lower. Um, and three can be the same. So that, that's interesting, Sarah. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to get you to know you a lot more through our calls because so far, yeah, you, uh, I can't peg you. Melissa, I can read you all day long. Janet, you too. Caleb, you too. Um, let's talk about an I. And I, I, I think Grady, Grady, if you took that test, I bet you, you would be an I. 
Um, Janet, you, I think you would, you, not in your natural state, but in your, in your work state, you would be an I. Brady, not so much. Caleb, not so much. Melissa, not so much. But I think, I think Grady, I think Grady would be an I. Here's what an I is. Good, bad, indifferent, or ugly, right? And you guys got to understand, the disc profile is going to give you two states, two, two things that you naturally are. And in Sarah's case, came out to three. That's a, that's a little rare. Um, when I talk about one or the other, like the pros and cons behind one, I want you guys to think about that person taking the disc profile and only having that one thing be the highest thing. So if I say, if we start talking about eyes, think that all the other three categories are super, super low. So I'm talking about a heavy extreme. So even if you are a high eye, if, if what I tell you doesn't really make sense, it's just because you're, you're, you, you more are probably neutral around a lot of your personality states. So I'm talking about the extremes is what I'm really trying to get at. So a high eye, a high eye, is that person who's outgoing. They don't have any fear around talking to anybody. If I talk to a high I and I tell a high I to go cold call 50 people, the only thing they're gonna tell, ask me is, is something along the lines of, yeah, no problem. Um, I just ask them to buy or sell a home, right? Yep, and they're just gonna go do it. They don't even think twice before they do. A high eye is, 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 is scary when they're at a college party and they're getting drunk because a high eye, you can convince to pretty much do anything you want because they just they naturally have no fear and you put a little alcohol in them, man, they're jumping off of cliffs and bridges and, and asking every girl in town for their phone numbers. They don't care. They will never care. It's easy for them. They don't get all sweaty. The only time a high eye gets all sweaty is after they make the wrong decision. <laughs> after they make something, they make an impulse buy or they make an impulse decision to do something. But the cool part about a high eye is that they don't have a fear. They, they just go do. They're, they're, they're what we're going to call the class clown. Meaning they, they just, there's no fear for them of interrupting the class. They don't really care if they upset the teacher. Um, they're happy to talk in class. They go out to the bars and they socialize. They like networking events. Um, and if they don't drink, they tend to like house parties and they like to have people over and they like barbecues and they like, they like people. Sarah, if you're a high I, has it been difficult to be kind of compliant with the stay at home orders and not get out and travel and do your thing? I'll be honest, no, actually. Uh, I think that's where my other categories fall in, just because if this is how it's got to be, it's got to be. I think I just, yeah, I think you're right. I just have a really adaptable personality because if I'm out socializing, I'm a social butterfly because I focus on making everyone feel comfortable and like making sure everyone's involved and I like making like that conversation. But if I'm home, then I'm like switched to an introvert. I'll stay in, I'll work at home, I'll play some video games in my free time and call it good. So I, I don't know, it's, it's weird, none, none of that bothers me. I'll just kind of jump from one thing to the other and call it good. <laughs> nice. Okay. Yep. And that's because, yeah, that's because you're, you're like a chameleon. You can adapt to pretty much anything. So think about those people in your life right now, guys, that are really struggling with being at home, right? that are really, really struggling with being at home. The people that you know that as soon as things lift, they're gonna be out and about and they're gonna be going to concerts and movies and, and events and out to eat and gatherings and groups and festivals and that's that person. That person that is on that extreme level is having a hard time right now. Now the weaknesses behind a high eye. We gotta talk about the pros and the cons, right? A high eye has too much emotion sometimes, meaning they ride that roller coaster of emotions. They can be up on the height of heights one day and in the lows of lows the next day. And they ride those emotions to a T, to a fault. 
You ever get that person when they ring your phone and you're going, oh my gosh, I, I don't know. This could be a great conversation and this could be absolutely horrible. Brady's laughing. Brady's got a friend like that. <laughs> it's my it's my wife's sister <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah you never know if that person's calling you to let you know that their dog died that day and their dog really didn't die they just that's just how they act like woe is me the world's after me i can't make anything right and i don't i don't really know how you can help me i just need a sounding board or your sister-in-law calls you <laughs> and uh all of a sudden, you know, they're just, they're just all excited. They're planning family vacation. They're super excited. They, they're getting shit packed for everything, everybody. They're, they're talking about coordinating this and that and da, 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 da. And then 20 minutes later, you didn't even get a word in. That, that's how you guys know you're talking to an extremely high eye. Speaking of the devil. No way she's calling. No, Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, there's social media heavy heavy social media they love that interaction <laughs> you want to see a high eye go nuts when they post something on social media that doesn't gain the likes that they were expecting drive nuts inside so that's that's their weakness their weaknesses is, is that on days that they don't want to do something I'm never going to be able to coach them out of that ever. Right. On days that they're on their height of heights, they need to understand that they've got to do everything that's in their power to stay focused that day and to use that energy because the day that they're on their lows of lows, they're not going to do anything. And it's going to be very hard for them to understand that tomorrow is a different day. And there's nothing wrong, good, bad, or indifferent with it, but, for a high D, it's very hard for me to relate to a high I because high D's and I's are on two polar opposite sides of emotions. A high D doesn't want to talk about emotions. They have emotions. They don't want to use them. They don't want to talk about them. They don't want to do anything with them. And a high I, you sit there and have somebody just gab and gab and gab and gab and gab and gab to somebody who's um, a high D, they ain't going to go very far. They're, they're going to shut down and they're not going to, they're going to stop listening to a high eye. The other issue with a high eye is that a high eye has issues listening to other people. The way that the other way that you know that you're talking to a high eye is when you constantly, if you get a chance to talk in the conversation, they're constantly going like this, waiting, waiting to spill out the next thing that they want to tell you. They're not listening to you. They just, they're ready to talk. They're ready. They're ready for you to shut up and for you to talk. So let a high I talk, let them talk. I'm a high D. So it's, I have to actually, I have to be the chameleon at that point in time. And I have to just go, Oh yeah. Okay. Sweet. No, that sounds awesome. Next thing I know I'm bobbing my head like a friggin' bobblehead because I'm so annoyed. My smile is fake. It's just, yeah. <laughs> It's so funny to say that. <laughs> High eyes to me, just, they suck the lifeblood out of me. Right? I cannot stand small talk. I don't talk about the weather. You guys, most of the time I get on a coaching call, I go, hey, sorry, it took me a few minutes to get off the phone. Most of the time when I'm, tr when I'm getting off the phone with somebody, because we talk for a little bit longer, because I just don't care. But the entire time, once the moment strikes, the half hour that I'm on the call with you and I have another person lined up, I'm sitting there going, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. I don't mean anything by it. I just, I'm just getting on to the next piece, right? So a high eye, let them talk, let them spill out their emotions. But here's what's hard about a high eye is they always want to talk. So let them get it all out. And you have to say things such as, Okay, are you sure that's everything? I really want to go into this next piece, but I really need you to focus and I need you to understand. I need you to, this is where I really need you to perk your ears up. This is where I blah, 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 blah. I have a lot of things that I say to a high eye to get them engaged, to let them understand that at this point in time, 
I'm going to set some expectations. At this point in time, I need them to listen. And, and better yet, I need them to listen empathetically. I don't want them to listen with the intent of replying. All right. Mm-hmm. Beating hot, we're beating eyes up. Let's beat, let's beat the other side of me up. I'm a high S. I think the majority of the, the room here is a high S at some point. Uh, Ruby, you're, you're, you're an extremely high S. You're on the 99th percentile and you don't even have to take that disc profile. Just by the way, you're smirking and you cock your head back and you're smiling right now. Jeffrey, same thing, my friend. You're not getting out of this. <laughs> extremely high S. Sarah, we already talked about you. Brady, you're a high S. Have you taken the disc profile? No, I'm going to, though. Yeah, you are. You're a high S. <laughs> Caleb, Melissa, Janet, I'm still trying to figure you out. But yeah, you, you love your family. I took the test twice, and those two times, I couldn't, like, really pinpoint what I was, so I'm doing it right now, too. Yeah, you're probably a lot like Sarah. I, I, I pick up, you're a lot like Sarah. Darby, tell everybody who you are. Um, when I'm at home, I'm extremely a high S, um, but I also adapt, so I'm the data-driven person that pisses everybody off. I like detail-oriented. I have to have systems. Uh, uh, I used to be called the audit queen because I love, I love everything being exactly how it needs to be. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, like what drives me is completely my family, a hundred percent. That's like, people are like, what's your motivation? And it's like my family. And they're like, no, 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 for you. And I'm like, no, 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 really. It's my family. That's my motivation. Um, so yeah, I mean, but I'm also very detailed in system. So, yep. The, there's, if you guys start to see a trait, there's a reason why a lot of us in the industry are high S's. You hear it all the time. Well, I've always just had this thing for homes and I want to help people. I want to help people. I want to help buyers. I want to help families. I want to help people. It comes out all the time in high S's. So a high S, quote unquote, is the, the family person. The, 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 the person that would do anything for anybody else except for themselves. The person that will drive themselves into the earth for other people. They will wear themselves out just to see other people in their life be happy. They, this is kind of like my definition for a high S. They make decisions off of other people's emotions and decisions. Here's a very clear example of when you have a couple. Uh, traditionally speaking, high S's attract high, uh, another high S or high S's attract a driver. Yeah, my husband's a, bit of a D, 100% a D. Yep, and my wife is a DS. I'm a DS. Ruby, do you, do you know who you're married to? I know you're just a, learning. A D. <laughs> You're married to somebody analytical, right? Um, and so you're. It, it, he, sorry, he's a cause be a high D and I. Oh, he'd be a high D and I. Okay, yeah. Okay, perfect. So, the reality with a high S is that their their pros are they're very patient. They listen very well. They feel emotions and can traditionally keep them in check now here's the key on the inside a high s does not feel like they can keep their emotions in check but in comparison to a high i they do very well most high s's if you walk past somebody and you smile they're gonna smile right back at you if you smile at a high d they may not smile at you because a high D is not saying, what are you smiling at me for? A high D is going, oh, crap, how do I know this person? <laughs> but they're upset. They just have this stoic feature to them. A type A, when you smile at a type A, they're going to give you if – they, if they smile, it's like this. Just, it's just, just quick, just back and down. A high S, they like to be around people. 
but they also like their own time. They like to be around people, but they don't want to be the center of attention. They like to be in a small group instead of a very large group, but they also like their time alone. They like emotion, they feel emotion. The problem with the high, so those are some of the positives, right? And you, you name it, those are great positives and attributes to have for real estate because that's what you have to have. You have to have patience with people. You have to listen to people's problems. You have to be their marriage counselor. You have to be their shrink. You have to be their voice of reason. You have to be their sounding board. Um, now a high S. They, they have trouble making decisions. Because they make decisions based upon other people's emotions, if they don't ask the right questions to understand the other person's emotion, they're not going to make the decision. When you have two high S's in the room and you ask them a question, they're both going to look at each other for validation around their answer. So you ever go into a room and you ask somebody a question or two people a question and they both look at each other, kind of nod and wink and head talk and whisper or talk out loud. And then they both look at you the same time and answer the same way. Most likely you're dealing with two high S's. Let me give you, let me just give you a real world example. And then let me see if any of you guys start laughing around this. When you and your spouse or significant other are looking to, to decide on where to go out to eat, Brady. <laughs> and you're looking to find out where you want to go out to eat. And you both are going, I don't care. Where do you want to go? <laughs> I don't care tonight. You pick tonight. No, for real. I, I, don't really, I don't really care. Well, okay. And somebody finally picks. And then they look at the other person and they're like, well, I really wasn't feeling that. <laughs> like, How many of you guys can relate to that? Every day. Every day. <laughs> usually then you have somebody that is, you usually have two S's. They, they make decisions based upon other people's emotions. Mark my words, Brady. I think you're a high S too. I, I haven't got to know you exactly, you know, but you, you interact, you and Jeffrey, you guys interact. And, and, but I think you guys have some high S in you. If you're, is it your fiance or your wife, Brady? Wife. Okay. If your wife would just tell you where she wants to go and, and she just chose one place, first chance, even if you didn't really want to go there that time, you'd probably say yes. Is that accurate or no? Absolutely. A, that's what a high S does. I'm a high S, man. I'm, I'm the same way. I'm like, look, just, just tell me where you want to go. <laughs> Because I know that whatever I'm going to bring up, you're going to have an opinion on. So let's, <laughs> let's just get this out of the way. <laughs> True. <laughs> All right. So that's what a high S is. That's what a high S does. Now, here's the cons. High S is they don't make decisions. So you need to make sure that if you're talking to a high S, you need to figure out if there's another person in their world that is the driver. That I hate this term, but where's the pants in the relationship, right? If you have two high S's in a, in a family, chances are one person has one pant leg on and the other person has the other pant leg on. And they're both kind of half, they're like, they're half ass drivers. Both don't really make a lot of decisions, but in one, fa usually two high S's, one does more of like the finances and bills and one more does the family coordination. They're, they're, they can balance each other out because they both wear one pant leg. Their weakness is they can't make decisions. So if you have two high S's that you're working with, you need to be the driver. That is, you very much need to feel comfortable guiding them and pushing their butts through the process. You need to say things such as, well, according to what I'm According to what I've heard throughout our consultation, it sounds like this house meets all of your guys' criteria. Do you guys see anything in the way of, of what would cause you to not make an offer on this property today? Hot, 
I hate to say it because you guys are going to hear me say it all the time. I'm not a selling person. I don't sell to people. I take that back when I talk to high S's. You have to ask those sales questions in a genuine way because otherwise they are just going to simply kick that freaking can down the street and that street will never end. You have to get them to make decisions and commit because they won't do it for themselves. Now, when I'm talking to a high I, I don't ask that question. I don't say, hey, based upon this house meeting every single one of your pieces of criteria, do you feel like we should maybe make an offer today? A high D, I'm just going to ask them straight up. So there's something in this house that's causing you not to make an offer, isn't there? Yeah, the kitchen's too small. Cool. On to the next. Let's go. A high S, I'm probably going to sit in the driveway and talk for 10 minutes around how the house fits all of the everything that they want to do, but they're still a little nervous about making a decision. That's just what they do. Just be prepared for it. So going through this consultation and going through with this buyer's lead sheet and asking them questions around criteria and really going deep with them, you guys are going to start chuckling in your head and you're going to think back to Brewster's words around this person's probably a driver. Now be careful. Don't, don't, you can judge someone around this interaction. Don't be judgmental. Test the waters. If they're showing you that they're a high D, be dominant, direct, and to the point, but don't be over the top. Just test the waters. Because within your first interaction, they may be showing you their what they, we call adaptive state. In my natural state, I'm a high S. In my adaptive state, I'm a high D. Which means if you put this buyer's lead sheet down in front of me, I'm going to answer questions like this. And it's going to be super quick. And there's going to be no fluff. But if you, if you treat me as a high D too much, it means you're never going to see the high S come out in me. So what I'm getting at is be careful. You're just right now making judgments. You're not practicing the being judgmental yet. So when you go through this buyer's lead sheet, know the disc profile, start to try and pick up on who they are. So let, let's, let's finish with I. Or I'm sorry. We already did I. We did S. We need to do C. A C also is my arch nemesis, just like a high I. A C makes decisions based upon facts, data, and analyses. The hardest part about real estate is facts and data come from the past. There's no crystal ball in real estate. We can only get real close. And that really, that really can tick off a high S. If you don't know how to verbalize how stats and today's market don't always coincide, you're always going to have them think that they can react to the market the way the, the, the past market reacted. So if you have stats coming out of winter and it's spring, they're going to be very focused on the stats around the winter market. And they stop listening about the strategy about our market today because they make decisions off of facts. The other thing about high C's are they procrast they don't procrastinate, they go through analysis paralysis. There's only one personality that actually makes decisions that will right decisions quickly, and that's a high D, that's a type A. And they don't always make the right decisions quickly. They know how to pivot and change their decision quickly if they made the wrong one. A high I makes the wrong decision because they're very excitable and they're not really thinking things through. A high S can make the wrong decision because they're basing a very large decision off of somebody else's emotions. And if they're not married to the person that's giving them their advice and they make the wrong decision that from the person that's not going to live with them, they can, make, they can buy the wrong house and they can feel very bad about it. And they'll never tell anybody how they truly feel deep down inside because they know that they made that decision based upon somebody else's advice. A high C has a hard time making decisions unless you give them all of the data. Now the problem with a high C is, is 
You can talk until you're blue in the face and they still think there's something else they need to learn, research, or look into every single time. So they love data. They're the ones that are going to come out of the gate and go, I have 20% down. I've already talked to a lender. I know how this process works because before I talked to you, I did four hours worth of research online about the home buying process. I would like three bedrooms with an office. The master needs to be a 12 by 12 or bigger. I need a his and her master closet, or I need a closet that's at least has uh, 10 linear feet of, 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 of hanger space. Like who measures linear speed of hanger space? I sees it's incredible. The, the <laughs> stuff that comes out of a high C's mouth is, is incredible. Sounds like an engineer shaking her head. <laughs> high C's are so data analytical. It's not even funny. So when you go, I just want to add what? Sorry, I just, I just want to add. I think it's really funny because my fiance is very much a high C. And as you're saying this, I'm like, oh, yep, check. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you, okay. And, and, and you, and you probably have to be the chameleon, which is why I probably pick up on you as being a driver because in your relationship, you're, you've got to be the driver. I, I almost guarantee it. Now, the only time he drives is when he's made the decision to do that thing and there's no stopping him because he's done all the research. That's the Spot on. decision. <laughs> yep. That's the time he makes any other time. If he hasn't done the research, Sarah's got to make the decision most of the time. Cool. So a high, a high C here's, so we talked, we actually kind of intermixed some pros and cons with the high C as <laughs> to know how to work with a high C, right? Give them the data and let them talk. Give them time to process. It, once I figure out somebody's a high C, mark my words, I do not force them into signing an agency agreement with me. High C's do not like to feel pressured into signing an agreement, especially when they're put on the spot in person and you give them a six page legal document, they're going to want to read every word of that. Now here's the key, and I'm, I'm hoping Sarah laughs at this. They're gonna wanna make you think they're going to read every word of the six page document. But the reality is, is they just don't want to sign something that they haven't had a chance to look at, think about and process. So some high C's will read every single bit of the agreement and some high C's will make you think they're going to go read every bit of the agreement. And what they'll do is they'll go home. They might read one or two pages and go, yeah, all of this makes sense to me. I think I'm ready to move forward. They just, Traditionally speaking, they don't do it right then and there. They'd like to take a day or two. They're the people that you know, say, well, Bruce, we really like this house. We're going to need tonight to think on it. And in this market, if you don't know how to talk about stats and how fast the market's moving and you don't provide enough information to a high C, then they're going to challenge you very much so to think on it overnight. If you guys go through this process and you ask a lot of questions and you go through and you set all these expectations up with the buyer, even a high C will make an offer the first day out. Because what happens is, is you take the stuff that you know about a high C and you know that in order for them to make a decision, they're going to need a few days. We'll take that away by speaking to them during their consultation to the point in which when you, when I'm done with a high C, if I was sitting down with Sarah and Mike, I can't remember her. I can't remember her husband's name uh, or no, she's getting married soon, but uh, yeah. Oh, it's Matt. Matt, Matt, not Mike. If I would sit down That's with okay. Sarah and Matt and figure out, see Sarah, she'd throw me for a loop. If I sat down with her in a buyer's consultation, I wouldn't be able to really pinpoint her. I would actually pinpoint her as a driver or a type D because of how Matt would probably interact with me. I'd probably be able to pick up on Matt being a high C. And then, so I'd have to look to Sarah to validate decisions. And I'd have to look at Matt to validate that he has all of his information. And both of them, 
if I were to talk to them, I'd be looking them both in the eye at different points in time. Some questions I look Sarah de dead in the eye and some questions I look Matt dead in the eye. And it's only because I'd be able to pick up on Matt. I would never still be able to pick up on Sarah just yet. But with Matt, by the end of the conversation, if I can pick out that he's a high, a high C, I keep saying I, I'm really sorry, a high C, if I can pick out that he's data analytical, I'm going to ask him and I'm going to say, hey, hey, Matt, you know, I totally get your thoughts and your questions and, and where we're at today. And to be honest with you, man, you know, I've got some agreements here that we're going to need to get signed before you, um, what's up, big guy? Good. I'm going to need to ask you some questions or ah, before we get started, I'm going to leave you with this agreement and I'm going to let you go home tonight and I want you to take some time and I want you to research it and I want you to review it and I want you to ask me any questions around it. Boom. I'm, I'm pushing back on a high eye because they need time and he's going to feel super comfortable with me and he's going to go, wow, this guy had his contracts filled out ready for me and didn't push me into signing it. They love that. I guarantee you when Matt goes out and finds and, and is looking for a new car, he's going to multiple different dealerships or he's only going to one dealership, but he's going to it multiple times. He might be set on a brand because he did the research online or from his past, you know, I, I, you guys probably what upper twenties, lower thirties. You, you guys probably, have had a few cars by now. So in buying a car for him, it pro he's probably visiting the same dealership a couple different times. He's probably picking out the car he wants to buy, going home and doing more research, going back to the dealership to buy it. Or he did all of his research for weeks on end up front online, goes to the dealership and buys it because he's, there's nothing else he needs to know. Now it's what color and what features. So when I know I'm dealing with somebody like that, Give them time. Go and let them take some time on the agreements. Because the other thing about a high C is, the reason why I don't mind getting the agreement signed is when a high C feels comfortable with me, the last thing a high C wants to do is go interview more agents because it's more time, more data, more things they have to research. It's more time out of their day. And I don't mean to, I've never met Matt, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rag on him a little bit right here. High C's don't want to go interview more agents because most of their days are spent do over researching things, over analyzing things, over questioning things. And since their life is already like that, the last thing they're going to do is go interview another agent in between the time that they meet with me and the time that they actually have time to review the agreements. Most of the time a high C will sign with you. It just might not be at the table. You guys, that's the diff profile. If you guys learn, I that, laugh at this. What's that? I'm go sorry. ahead. No, go I ahead. laugh at this because what's funny is when I first hired my first real estate agent to help us buy the house, my husband's very much a D. So he's like, "Yeah, I'll sign whatever you give me. I don't care. Let's go." Um, I want to look at one house and one house only. Well, she, I don't think understood that I was like an SC. I'm pretty close. So I needed to have all the info and I needed to be in a specific area and I wanted a specific budget and I knew what my payment wanted to be like to the dollar. Um, and she didn't get that. And so I ended up like, I'm not going to budge. Like, even though my husband's the driver, ultimately we never bought because of that because she didn't communicate in my way. And so I was just like, Nope, I don't like that one. And no, I don't want to go look at these ones and Nope, I'm done. Yep. Um, this is exactly what I want and I'm not going to move until I get what I want. Um, and then, so we ended up firing her cause she wasn't getting that information from me. And then the second one is a KW agent down in Arvada and she's very familiar with the disc profile. She knew my husband was a dr driver, but she also knew that the C part of me, ultimately when it comes out to buying a house, the C part of me is dominant. And so she was like, okay, this is your mortgage payment and this is what you want to be. And before we go see any house, she already knew those numbers for me. And so when we found our home, we're in the kitchen and she said, this is what your mortgage would be about. This is what, this is 
you know, this is your three bedroom, three bath. This is your three car garage. Da, 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 da. Like, and so we ended up looking at five homes. Guys, Darby, I, for everybody on the video, I didn't set this up. Darby, thank you. you guys, this is, exactly, no. <laughs> this is exactly what I'm talking about. Did you just hear what she said? If you guys learn this, you guys nail the consultation intro. You can fumble through the rest. Nail the intro. Understand your, your, your audience. The disc profile, it, the reason why I gravitate to the disc profile is because I'm a high D. I don't like a lot of data. I don't like a personality test that takes 45 minutes. I want one that takes 10 minutes. I've never found a personality test that was more spot on, that takes less time for people to take, and that really resonates to the description around them. Her agent did that. They showed five houses to a high C. Somebody, a high C wants to, deep down inside, Darby wants to see 30 homes, guaranteed before making a decision. Sarah, Matt needs to see 30 homes before making a decision. You guys use this and you guys cater to them and you guys prep them up front. You're out there showing five to seven homes. It doesn't matter the personality. All right. We're beating, the, we're beating it up like a dead horse. We're at two hours. If you guys have a few more time, a, a little bit more time, there's one other piece I want to finish up on. And then I want you guys to ask any questions. Going through the buyer's lead sheet. Okay. And, 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 and let me precurse. The reason why I'm not going through the entire consultation is because I, my consultations alone are two hours. Let alone when I teach you guys them, it could be two hours and 15 minutes itself. So we'll do another video, another class around that. And I need you guys to attend because it's going to be an interaction back and forth. It's going to be a live buyer's presentation with one of you guys that volunteers or voluntold. And we're going to go through it. So we're going to not do that for today's purposes, but I do need to get through this buyer's lead sheet because we, the last thing we got to talk about how to win with a buyer is to get over the fact that buyers are not liars. They are not liars. We didn't ask enough questions. And the buyer's lead sheet is exactly where you need to ask questions. And I wanna teach you guys how to go three questions deep. Three questions deep, you're gonna hear me say it time and time and time and time again. Because if you're not going three questions deep, you will always think that your clients are lying to you. And what it is is that your clients don't lie to you they just don't tell you what's on their mind. You have to pull it out. They feel like they've told you enough because that it's in their mind. Do you guys ever have people in your life where you're trying to find something and you're like, where the heck is this at? And they're like, it's right over there. They see it in their mind. They know where it's at and they just tell you it's right over there. When in reality, they're not looking at it from your point of view. Something's blocking it. Something's in front of it. Something got moved to the point where when somebody says it's right over there, they truly believe that in their mind. But instead of us saying, I can't, instead of us saying, I can't find it. What are you talking about? We need to ask that person the question. Oh, it's right over there. Is it in the drawer or outside of the drawer? Is it on the top shelf or on the bottom of the shelf? What is it beside so instead of getting frustrated with people, because if you guys can resonate with me, I, I'm literally talking about my wife and I in the freaking refrigerator. Can't find the hot sauce that I want. She knows right where it's at because I, I, I do the dishes at my house. I, I, like to, I like to cook and I like to do the dishes. I don't like to put things away. So my wife puts things away. If she doesn't put the hot sauce back where I want the hot sauce to be and I can't find it, it's up to me not to get frustrated with her. She's telling me it's in the fridge, right? We know it's in the fridge because that's where it goes. But if I can't find it, I don't want to say, where did you put it? I can't find it. I want to ask more questions. Honey, did you put it in the door or on a shelf? I think it's on a shelf. Honey, is it high or low? I don't know. Use your eyes. I'm just trying to help here. I just want to eat my food while it's hot and I can't find the damn hot sauce. I know this is kind of a corny and little, you know, example for you guys, but the reality is what Darby you're on mute. I said, it's so true though. 
these yeah. don't want to freaking look at anything. They just want it now. <laughs> they can't see it. <laughs> well, and, 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 and it's the same way with, with buyers, right? Yeah. We don't go three questions deep. We feel like they're lying to us. And here's my prime example. On location, on location, ingrain this in your head. You have to go four questions deep. Why? Because there's four directions, guys. So three questions deep or four questions deep means you need to hone in. And here's my prime example of the whole, it's in the refrigerator conversation. Darby, I want to buy a house and I want to live, I want to live in Longmont. And Darby oh. takes it as, no, we, we don't, I, we don't, we're, we'll role play, we'll role play through three questions deep when we do the consultation. Sorry, I'm just picking on you. Darby, I want to live in, I want to live in Longmont. All right, so Darby takes it as face value. She sets me up for a search in Longmont. And then what happens? I send Darby, uh, I send Darby an address from a home I saw on Zillow from a little town called Mead. Got a Mead address, but it's really close to Longmont. And I asked Darby, hey, I like this house. I know you didn't send it to me, but I want to go take a look at it. Darby looks it up and sees, wow, wow, it was listed two days ago. And our buyer consultation was a week ago, which means I should have sent them this home. Why didn't I send this home to him? Oh, it's in Mead. I didn't think they wanted Mead. So I call my buyer back and now I'm the, I'm the pompous prick that calls my buyers back and goes, hey, I don't know if you knew this, but I didn't send it to you because it's not in Longmont. And the buyer's gonna go, well, well, it's close enough. Can we go see it? And you're gonna go, well, no, I'm sorry. It went under contract like two days ago. Do you want me to include Mead in your search? Boom. You guys, that, that point in time is when you start going three questions deep. It's already too late. Your buyer's upset that they didn't go see an awesome house that they would have went and seen. They look at you like you don't know what you're doing and how to set up a search. You feel like the buyer's changing their criteria, which means they lied to you the first time around. You see how that snowball happens? If we just take a couple extra seconds to just ask a few extra questions at the consultation, now this is where you save yourself the other 10, 20 hours out there with a buyer. If that conversation just took you another five minutes when in the consultation, you're already sitting in front of them, you're already asking them about criteria and you already set up their, their search. Now you have to have a five minute conversation on the phone, looking up a property. They probably would have made an offer on. They can't make an offer on it. They don't think you know what you're doing. Now you got to get back into their search and now you added me. Well, now what if a property comes up, let's say in Erie or Niwot or Hygiene or Firestone, all the surrounding areas of Longmont. Now I just took again, face value. I asked one more question. Mead is okay. So I added Mead. A week later, we see a couple properties in Mead and Longmont. And then they send me a Frederick address and they're like, Hey, why didn't you send me this? And then finally, after the third conversation, you're going, wait, we got to We got to dial this in. Darby, tell me where, where all are you looking for homes? I thought you said Longmont. And so now we're getting defensive. We start to put down on our clients when in reality, we just didn't do our job. We didn't go three and four questions deep at the consultation. Now we've got another 15, 20 minutes talking to them on the phone, updating their, their MLS around one thing, guys, around location. Think about how many other things there are for them to buy bedrooms, bathrooms, square foot, garage space, yard size, um, you name it, like name some other attributes, right? Style of home. Are you okay with the two story? Do you need a ranch level home? Do you want a basement finished, unfinished, no basement? Does it matter? What do you care? What do you want? Budget. Your max is 450. Is that your absolute budget max? Or is that what the lender told you? What's your comfortable max price point? Got to go three and four questions deep. And number one thing that if you do that, 
you'll save yourself the other time out there. So know the disc profile. That cuts down your hours out there. Knowing who your audience is allows you to ask what questions you need to ask when you're showing homes and you're getting down to five to seven homes, just like Darby's example. Then going three and four questions deep saves you time, energy, and effort over the phone because once you get done and you set up their buyer search in the MLS, you know it's so dialed in that the homes that you're going to send them are the homes that are going to, every single one should meet their criteria, which means every single one, if it looks okay, they should be wanting to go out and take a look at. Which means when you get to the home and you start talking to them, and we're going to get into this in, in, in next week's class, when you start to talk to them about making an offer, you can say things such as, well, I feel like our search online is set up correctly. So we've been really weeding through some homes and we've been seeing a lot of homes online. Just because now we're seeing them in person doesn't mean you're missing anything, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer. Because do you agree that our search is set up right? We're sent, we're, every house that we're sending is pretty much in direct alignment. I think it's about time to make an offer, don't you? They're making offers within five to seven homes. But it's because we went three questions deep. It's because my buyers don't, my buyers never send me property addresses and ask me why I didn't send them to them. It's, it's simply because I, I dial that in. So any questions? Well, let's go through a real world example on three questions deep. Jeffrey. Jeffrey, my friend. So I appreciate it, man. I, I like that you're looking in Loveland. Um, let me just ask you a few questions about Loveland. Do you want to live like in Loveland city limits or are you okay, are you okay with Loveland and surrounding? Uh, I'm, well, I'm, what I'm really trying uh, to achieve is just find a place that's um, within a uh, manageable driving distance to work. So uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, within 20 minutes, 20 nice. minutes of work. Okay, 20 minutes of work. That's great. So what's your, what's your work address, Jeffrey? I'll do a map search around that. Okay, well, uh, it's um, 2932 Oot, uh, yeah. Oot Highway. Yeah, I don't really know yeah. that address. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. 123 Main Street, right? Yeah. Cool. Well, hey, man, what, what I'll tell you is, is I, I, I'll, I'll, get that go, I'll get that going for you. Now, when you say 20 minutes around your work, that encompasses pretty much all four directions, Jeffrey. What, um, are you opposed to, you know, anything south? Are you opposed to any one direction around your work? I know it needs to be within 20 minutes, but some people don't want to go very far west. Some people only want to stay on the right side of their job. Do you have any opinion around that? Well, I like to, uh, my wife and I like to travel to Boulder a lot to go out to eat. So uh, close proximity to Boulder. So okay. preferably yeah, south, south uh, west would be preferred. Nice. So I have to ask you, Jeffrey, if the perfect property came up and it was 19 and a half minutes away from your job, but it was on the polar northeast end of your drive distance to work. Would you be opposed to looking at that home since you tend to gravitate towards wanting to be closer to Boulder? Uh, if the price is right, uh, that wouldn't be a problem at all. Cool. So uh, um, uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Did you guys see how my last question was so in depth? so ingrained to the point where if, if I send him a property that's perfect and it's 19 and a half minutes away from work and it's on the northeast side of, of, of the drive in comparison to Boulder, he's willing to take a look at it. So now when I find that property, if Jeffrey objects to it, I'm going to ask him that question again and I'm going to, I'm going to ask him if he's changing his mind on his answer. I'm not calling him a liar. He can't, he's not lying to me. He's just realizing that the answer he gave me might be changing. And it's my job to make sure that those answers are still the same week after week. So I follow up with every single one of my buyers every single week, as long as they're out looking and actively searching. If they're three and four months out, trust me, I don't call them every day or every week. But the buyers that are out looking, pre-approved, ready to go. I make sure that I hone in on them and their criteria every week. And that's my follow-up. Doing that, you guys, my calls, my follow-up calls are 30, 40 seconds. I show them five to seven homes and I only spent maybe a half an hour to an hour over the phone, pre-qualifying them. 
another two hours at the consultation. So I'm up to three hours with the buyer, five to seven homes, even if their homes are a half an hour apart is maybe another 10 hours. So I'm up to 13. And then they say on average in the transaction, you can spend anywhere from eight to 15 hours on the file. So guys, again, I just took a buyer's average of 50 hours we condensed it down into about a 20 hour process. You guys, I hope this helps you guys. I, I, there's still more into this, but you guys, we went over it. I, I, I know this, this class, like the back of my hand, and I added about a 20 to 30 minute segment on the disc profile, right? This talks about educating your buyers. We talked about that. We talked about having a buyer's, you know, a presentation. We, we talked about that. Go through here. Cause there's a lot of like this, this, the stuff that I skipped, right? These are the home buying guide. I don't go over the home buying process in this class because the home buying process is not what wins a buyer. The home buying process is just how the process is going to go and how you educate them. And we'll do that in our buyer's consultation. Okay. Any questions before we, before we cut the recording, before we cut the recording. You can ask me all your other questions. Cool. The other piece that this class goes over is exactly what I appreciate you guys coming to is scripts practice on Mondays and Wednesdays, 8.30 to 9. I go over, we can go over any buyer objection known to man. It has been a little over two years now since I haven't won a buyer's consultation when I'm interviewing with another agent. You guys need anything around buyers. I became a master over a three year buyer period. And I'm telling you, there's not one thing I haven't been asked and there's not one stone I haven't overturned, un overturned with a buyer. Ask me anything. Sellers too, guys. The reality is, is I got so bored with buyers. I got so bored with buyers that I started learning everything there was to know around a seller and how they think and how they act that I started using that with my buyers and winning them even further. Now that's like a, that's like a, that's a, that's a ignite 201 class. Um, but if you guys have questions, please, please, please ask. It doesn't have to be right here. Grady's an ID. Oops. I'm sorry. That was, that was to me privately. I, I don't know if I should have shared that with him, but he said spot on. He's an ID. You guys, once you start to learn this and you guys start to go through this, I'm telling you guys, it, 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 that, that, that disc profile is almost a fail safe for me. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to, can you guys see this? I'm going to go, I'm going to go get my suit on and jump in this beautiful pond. It's like 90 some degrees out here and I am, I am hot. Nothing. Thank you, Bruce. See you Thank you. Thanks, Bruce.